once word got out about Christopher Columbus's successful voyages across the Atlantic, many other adventurers and explorers sailed off in search of this wondrous place. They were all motivated by the possibility of becoming rich and perhaps even discovering new trade routes to the East Indies. Before long, the explorers were replaced by conquerors who intended to take charge of this new land, its wealth, and its people. For a while, Spain focused most of its energies on getting as much gold and silver from Central and South America as it could, though some Spanish scouting parties even ventured into southern parts of North America and beyond. This left the seemingly less appealing North America wide open to the ambition and greed of the French, English, Dutch, and the others. The people of these countries had heard stories of the vast amounts of gold and silver the Spanish had found in Central and South America. These new explorers and adventurers intended to become rich too. They not only hoped to claim land, but to bring back ships laden with valuable gold and silver for their proud kings and queens. In the early 1600s, the French ventured onto land in North America. French explorers, such as Samuel de Champlain, set up fur trading stations along the St. Lawrence River in what is present-day Canada. The Dutch sailed up what is now known as the Hudson River through present-day New York. The English set sail for Virginia. At this time, all new lands and treasures were usually claimed for the nation that the ship and the crew sailed under. In other words, the lands were claimed for the already wealthy kings and queens of Europe. Aww. However, these three nations soon discovered that, although there was plenty of land, there was very little gold and silver to be found. This certainly was the case for those who set off to explore and possibly settle in Virginia. In 1606, on a cold, wintry day in December, three English ships set sail for Virginia. More than 100 men and a handful of boys were on board the Discovery, the Susan Constant, and the Godspeed, under the command of Captain Christopher Newport. Some of the men were well-known, daring adventurers. Others were seasoned or very experienced sailors. There were farmers and skilled craftsmen on the journey, too. Imagine agreeing to set sail across a vast ocean in a small, not so sturdy ship. More than likely, you are not a trained sailor and like hundreds of others on board, you're hoping to find a land that very few Europeans have been to before. Perhaps during the voyage, you suffer from seasickness or become fearful of encountering sea monsters. Oh, and by the way, only men and boys were allowed on most voyages such as this one. Investors in a company that came to be known as the Virginia Company of London paid for the voyage. The main purpose of this expedition was to make money by trading. Everyone involved, especially the investors, expected to get a generous share of the profits. They hoped to trade with the native people and to find, among other things, precious metals. In addition, King James I of England had given the men a charter or official document that allowed them to claim a very large area of land in the New World. This area of land stretched from what is now the state of South Carolina all the way up the East Coast to Canada. Clearly, King James had not considered that other people might be living on this land who might not want him to claim it as his own. Because the party of Englishmen and boys had set off in December, Strong winter storms made their journey even more difficult. They also ran perilously low on food and water. However, the passengers and crew survived and five months later, in May 1607, they finally caught a glimpse of land. They sailed closer to the shoreline into what is now called the Chesapeake Bay area. As they approached this new land, they decided to sail up a wide river they had spotted to avoid being seen by the Spanish, some of whom were exploring the present-day areas of Florida and Georgia. Because King James was eager to claim everything the English saw, this river was promptly named the James River in honor of His Royal Highness. This would be the final part of their journey. As the men sailed up the newly named James River, they were on the lookout for a safe haven, a 
protected area where they could moor or dock their ships. About 60 miles upriver, they found an area of land with deep water near the shoreline. The land appeared to be unoccupied. It was time to drop anchor. The next day, the would-be settlers ventured ashore. With much pomp and circumstance, they stepped onto Virginia soil. Trumpets were sounded, prayers were said, and it was proclaimed that this new land was now the property of... Can you guess who? Let me give you a clue. He wore a crown, and his name was James. Aww. Yes, that's right, His Majesty King James I. As you can see, there were many advantages to being a king in those days. The Eastern Woodland Indians had lived in this region for many, many years. What they thought of the arrival of these uninvited visitors is not clear. No doubt they kept a careful eye on these strangers from the safety of the shadowy forests. Although some Native Americans had heard about and come in contact with Europeans, they didn't know or trust this particular group. One thing was certain, they were not going to hand over their homeland to King James willingly. As it was late spring, it was warm and there was an abundance of plants and wildlife. The settlers cheerfully set to work. They began to construct a small settlement containing basic homes, a storehouse, and a chapel. To protect their settlement, they built high walls made of logs around it and placed a cannon nearby. There was only one possible name for this new settlement, and it was, of course, Jamestown. Jamestown became England's first permanent settlement in America. It wasn't long before a group of Powhatan, led by a chief of the same name, came to watch what these intruders were up to. As the days went by, the Powhatan became angry at the sight of what appeared to be the construction of a permanent settlement. Eventually, the Powhatan took action and attacked the settlers. The settlers had not chosen the site of their settlement wisely. So close to the water, the land turned out to be marshy and full of mosquitoes. When they dug down into the earth to find drinking water, they found the water to be virtually undrinkable because it was brackish or salty. To add to the problem, some of the settlers wanted to focus on searching for gold and silver instead of planting seeds of much needed crops. Away from the safety and familiarity of England, the group began to disagree. It was clear that the settlers of Jamestown needed a leader. At some point during the summer, it was decided that Captain Newport and a small group of men would take the Godspeed and the Susan Constant back to England. Once there, they would spread the news about this new land that King James and England had acquired, and they would load up the ships with much needed supplies to return to Jamestown. With this decision made, someone needed to take charge of those staying behind. For a while, several of the men argued about who knew best what to do and how to survive. And then, the weather became warmer, much warmer than they were used to in chilly England. Various members of the party became sick with fever and disease that could not be cured. People began to die. With death, sickness, and disputes or arguments occurring daily, not enough work was being done to prepare for the cold winter months. One man in particular realized that this was a big problem. In order to survive, he knew that they would have to come up with a plan. And this man's name was Captain John Smith. <laughs>